Today on Cross Defense, we continue our conversation on divisions in the church, this time going to First Clement to let him lead us into the Bible. And uh, we're also going to talk about what you do if you don't live near a faithful church. All that and more coming up, so let's get into it. It's time for some more Cross Defense. Thanks for tuning in. This is Cross Defense, the show where we aim to equip your mind, excite your imagination, and comfort your soul, doing all of that with God's Word, rightly distinguished between law and gospel. This is a wonderful supplement to your your nourishment in God's Word. I hope that your main source of nourishment is coming from the divine service. It needs to be. It must be. That is the way the Lord has established it, that you're in church week in and week out, and then you are in the Word throughout the week, daily, as you wait to get back to where the Lord has promised to serve you, where two or three are gathered in his name, where we gather together to stir one one another up in the faith, where we receive both God's word and his sacraments, all of his means of grace, all the ways in which he gives us his grace. That is where he's promised to do it. Not here on the radio, not in your uh, phone, on your app, not, not by yourself, wherever you're reading scripture. That's A wonderful blessing. Keep doing that, but do that as a uh, supplement, like vitamins to your meal. And your meal is the divine service where you literally receive the Lord's Supper. Okay, so today on the show, we're talking about 1 Clement. And 1 Clement is going to take us into Scripture as we look at division. So today is really just a uh, sort of a follow up to last week's episode where we talked about the singular source of division in the church in the visible church not the invisible church but the visible church we can talk more about that subject later as well another episode uh, but we're going to we're going to see how the rejection of scripture which is that singular source of division uh, can cause other problems too and this one's going to be kind of ratcheting it a little bit narrowing down into envy and emulation and causes of strife within the church and look at it, looking at those particulars. But before we get to that, let's have a look at our email. We've received some emails and a personal question regarding some previous shows. So as we just kind of get our feet wet in the pool, let's hear from some of the listeners. So this one comes in from Carl. Carl says, Pastor Bramwell, well done today. He's writing in on the show of, uh, what was it? Uh, oh yeah, Equality, Satan's Lie, back from... Let me see. When was that show? That show was on September 24th. So he was responding to September 24th. Well done today, he says. Karen and I truly enjoyed your program about equality and Satan's lies. You were right on the mark. Keep telling the truth. God bless your brother in Christ. Thank you, Carl, and God bless you and Karen as you continue to listen and continue to be served by God's word. Yes, Satan is a liar. Uh, As Walter pointed out in his lectures on communism and socialism, equality is one of Satan's greatest lies in our day and age. Uh, It's the the zeitgeist. It's part of the whole wokeism that we're dealing with. And that gets me to the next comment sent in. This one is from Kim. She says, good morning, Pastor Bramwell. I came across your podcast on Spotify. Everything you said is what I believe as a Christian. Well, thanks, Kim, for... uh, for finding us on Spotify. I hope you're still listening. I, uh, I'm very pleased to find out that you, know, you found us. So thank you very much. She says uh, she wanted others to listen as well, and I've emailed her about that and getting in, co- in contact with, um, with them. So uh, thank you for saying the hard to hear things, Kim said. You are most welcome, Kim. It is hard to say, but when we're speaking the truth, that's all we have to do. We don't have to figure out whether it's easy or hard, as Paul told Timothy, right? We are to declare the word in season and out of season, whether it's popular or not. And uh, when we have that understanding that it doesn't matter what I'm saying, if I'm saying God's word, it needs to be said. And so it makes it a little, little easier to say the hard things, yet they are still hard. And we're, we're certainly doing the work of trying to teach our people to be able to say those hard things. We are living in a time where we really, there is really a lot of the uh, scratching of itching ears, isn't there? And even within our own. I mean, we personally, me, I like to have my ears scratched. We are such a politically correct culture that anyone who says something that might ruffle our feathers, that's just, oh, it's so hard to put up with. And so 
we kind of create our little uh, echo chambers and our little tribalisms and things. And we don't, we just want people to say what we want them to say. We want them to confirm our bias, right? Our, uh, confirm our bias, bias confirmation. Now, the last comment didn't come in through the email. My wife uh, is the commenter here. She was listening to last week's episode of the show as we talked about the singular source of division in the church. And I, I cited in the beginning of that show, CFW Walther and his thesis on uh, fleeing from heterodox teachers. And, and so Mrs. Bramwell asked me, well, what do you do? What do you do if there is not a faithful church in your area? What's the Christian to do? And uh, I don't think I gave her a sufficient answer <laughs> uh, there in the kitchen. I think I just told her, well, you should be living where there is one. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me elaborate on that for you and for her, as she's probably listening to this episode as well. And that is truly what I mean. We, we need to kind of take note of what's important in our lives. Too many times people will move and live according to where their work is, uh, where they would like to have, you know, certain sort of social activities, perhaps, you know, they, they'll move from living with mom and dad when they're kids in a, you know, sort of run of the mill, middle of the road, population wise community in America, and they'll move to the city. Now the city has this thing and that thing. It offers this and that. Although nowadays, <laughs> it seems like people are fleeing the cities. Uh, God be praised for that, where it's much more uh, conducive to so wholesome Christian values, I would say. But but we do find people move for work. They they move for uh, school opportunities. They think things like this, but they don't often. We don't hear at least that they're that they're moving for church. It used to be that people would want to live close to their church. I remember serving, when I served in Utah, Murray, Utah, a suburb of Salt Lake City, um, World War II vet lived right next door to the church. I mean, it was back to back. He could throw a rock from his backyard and hit the sanctuary wall. And, and this wonderful saint of a man never moved away, never wanted to move away. And he, one of his reasonings, at least what he told his pastor, perhaps he told someone else something different, but what he told me was, why would I want to move any farther away from my church? This is where my church is. That's how things used to always be. People would want to live within walking distance of their church. Can we get back to that? So if, if you're living in an area where there isn't a faithful church, and, and Walther's thesis, if you recall, talked about the peril of losing salvation— if you're living where there's a church that's, say, it's hard to put percentages on these things, sorts of things, but say 80%, they're, they're giving you 80% of the biblical truth, but they're, they're missing the mark on the other 20%, and you can identify that, and you know it. Why are you living somewhere where your salvation is at risk? That's an interesting question, isn't it? If eternity, eternity outweighs our temporal existence, shouldn't protecting our eternal salvation be the number one priority in where we live? Shouldn't it be the thing that drives our considerations of relocating? I think it should. I really think it should. I, it may not be practical. I get that from the world's perspective, but you're, I'm speaking to Christians. I'm speaking to cross defenders here. You guys understand just how important it is to, to have Christ's cross in your life, defending you from the attacks of the evil one, defending you from the attacks of the woke mob, from, from a culture that is shifting and sliding further and further into the demonic darkness. Come to the lighthouse, right? We want to live close to where the light is. So there's that. Now, that's not just my opinion. Um, that's how the church has always operated historically. And, uh, you know, here in Ferndale, we're a town of 1,300 people near, uh, you know, a town of about 30,000. But we have in our town of 1,300 people, six churches. Now, they're not all operational anymore, but most of them are major structures. And as I've recently learned, they were built by European settlers who came here and who, who made church life the main driving force of the social cultural life of Ferndale. 
Now, Ferndale is slipping from that as the entire Western world is slipping from the church. But also think about this. If everyone was moving to where their faithful church was, that entire community, that city, that town, that village, whatever it is, would be filled with fellow believers. Think about the social influence, the peer pressure you would have on your side as you're raising your children or your grandchildren, as you're building your family life, if everyone or the majority of people in your community, in your town, went to your church, if they were Christians of the like mind, united in, in mind, how wonderful of a community you would have, the support you would have when you are teaching your children what to do, you know, how to do things that are right, to obey the Lord. And they say, but are the other kids are doing it. Well, no, they're not. They wouldn't be able to have it. The argument would be gone. The other kids aren't doing that. This is what we used to have. When America was a, a predominantly Christian culture, we could rely on the fact that our, the other Christian parents were, were raising their children according to the same word that we were hearing, that we were receiving from church. And, and we could bank on the fact that they knew what we knew and that they were raising their kids in accordance to Scripture just as we were. We were united in that. We've lost that. We've lost that. Now, there is another interesting part to this. Let's say you don't live, right now, you don't live somewhere where there's a faithful church and you don't really see how you could move for various reasons. Well, in the old days, they would write to the church, the denomination, the headquarters, write to St. Louis and say, hey, send us a missionary. Send us a faithful pastor. Yes, there's a great book out here in California that I found that I came across when I first moved out to California as a pastor called The Romance of Lutheranism in California. And in the beginning of it, page 12, we get this Macedonian call, this letter written back to St. Louis requesting a pastor. Listen to what this wonderful woman has to say. I simply must write to you now. Now that I'm in California already these four years and have looked over several places, Christians and especially Lutherans here present a sad sight. They soon forget their good old Lutheran church. This all the more so because there are no churches true to the faith around here. There are five German churches out this way, one in Sacramento, one in Stockton, two in San Francisco. These four are Methodist with few members, perhaps 15 to 20 or fewer. But many people have their children baptized there and are sending them to these Sunday schools to let them learn German since there is nothing better to be had. Quite recently, a man by the name of Ron of the United Church came to San Francisco from Philadelphia. Now, this is the, the fifth church. Now, the people think they have something better with him. Already 75 members have joined, the salary is about twice that of the white-collar worker. The congregation contemplates the construction of a church next year. I regret to note that so many of the sects are dominant here, while my dear mother church must take a back seat. I am amazed that the church of the true faith does not make an effort to go after the lost sheep also here in California in the name of the Good Shepherd. Dear Lutheraner, so she was reading the Lutheran witness of her day, reported some time ago that two missionaries were to be sent to California, provided the necessary funds could be found. But does not this amount to taking counsel with flesh and blood? If they turn out to be faithful workers, they will certainly find their livelihood here. The Lord always provides for his own. Dear sirs, over there in the States, there are many Lutherans here, at least in name, but all they see here are the united churches, quote-unquote. I fervently hope and pray that soon a man will come, not seeking after his own, but after that which is Christ's. What a wonderful letter. This woman surveyed her territory. California wasn't even a state. She surveyed it. She found in the entire region there for the Lutheran the German population, I should say, the German population, that there was a few German churches, but they weren't Lutheran. They were of the sectarian sort. They were not preaching and teaching the truth of Scripture, orthodoxy. 
but they're heterodox ways. And so instead of sitting back and watching as the children are raised to be Methodists rather than Lutherans to be part of the United Church instead of part of the Lutheran Church, the mother church, the one true church, she says, as it is, she acted on it. She engaged with the people who had the ability to send missionaries. And she even, and this is something I think every pastor out there should listen to. This is something. What if they don't have money to do it? And she says, isn't this reasoning uh, taking counsel with flesh and blood? She says, why are you worried about your income? Why are you worried about the missionaries' income? If they are found to be faithful workers, they will certainly find their livelihood here. This is so true today. Too many times, I know this from being in the ministry, too many times us, us, us pastors consider our livelihood, our income, all the, the benefits, the insurance package, uh, you know, where we'll live and all this kind of stuff. We, we consider these things and we're considered to be wise for doing so before we take a call. And she says right here, and this lady's name is Mrs. Schreiber, although the letter was written anonymously f at first, but her name is Mrs. Schreiber, as was found out later. She says, that's reasoning according to flesh and blood. That's not trusting God. I pray, Praise be to God for a woman of this kind of faith. We need more of that today in the church. Someone who believes, people, many people, not someone, some ones who actually trust the Lord, that he will provide for his own. She says, the Lord always provides for his own. Dear sirs, over there in the States, there are many Lutherans here, at least in name, but all they see here are the United Churches. Come on, we got to solve this. we got to fix this problem. It's not good enough to have them going to a church. I'm just glad they're going to a church. No. They got 80% truth. That's risking their salvation. Let's give them the whole truth. <laughs> but nothing but the truth. All right, so we're starting to wrap this up. I, I, I should say, too, you know, this is actually, this came about in my call to Ferndale. And I've been called to Ferndale twice. So my first call, as I was coming from Salt Lake, I was told by the, the, by the district, thankfully, rightfully, I mean, it, this is the kind of stuff that pastors do well to hear. I was told that St. Mark Lutheran Church here in Ferndale could probably afford to pay me for three years, and that was accurate. That was what their, their, their bank account looked like. That if we go by earthly standards and earthly measurements, human reason, they got about three years of ministry. And I said, hey, the Lord's going to call me there. If he's calling me there, we'll see what happens. Three years is a good long run for a minister in a certain area, right? I mean, that's that's a mission call there, and I do treat this as a mission call. And uh, look, we're, we're into year six, going on seven, and we are like every other church. We're always wondering about where the money's going to come from, but the Lord keeps providing and we're still here. Okay. So that's the first segment of the show. Hang on with me for a second. And when you come back, we're going to talk about Clement and some more about division and what we can do to get rid of it. You're listening to Cross Defense. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share -thon for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. Well, Mrs. Bramwell, I hope that's a satisfactory answer to your question, more so than what I gave you as you were listening to the show. Uh, but seriously, folks, if you are living in an area that does not have a faithful church nearby, practically get online and go to lcms.org slash locator. Go to the LCMS's locator. You can look up churches there. You can look up schools. You can look up church workers. It's a really robust tool. Look up a church in your area by your zip code. You can do uh, you know, distance ranges, how far away you want to search within your proximity to your area. Find out if there's something near you. you know, uh, here in my area, I'm in. I'm like off the beaten path in Ferndale. The major 
you know, metropolitan area is Eureka. That's where all the people live. And then next to that is Fortuna, where the rest of the people live. And there's not an LCMS church there. They're, they got all the wacky stuff going on there. If they want a faithful Orthodox church, they're going to have to come to Ferndale. But if they do a search in Eureka and they have the proximity set for more than 12 miles, they'll find us. And many people are driving from Eureka to Ferndale because of that. So uh, I would say start there. If you don't have something within your area, if, there's a, if it's a long distance, then contact the LCMS. Contact a, the district. You can get on the LCMS.org, and you can figure out how to get a hold of people there and say, hey, I want to start an LCMS church in my town. Help me. And uh, they'll certainly have that conversation with you and figure out how to get that going and, and move that down the road. So, okay, that's, that's great. Uh, practical advice, and thank you, Mrs. Bramwell, for that wonderful question. Moving on to First Clement. You know anything about First Clement? This letter was written in around 95 AD. It's said to be the earliest known piece of Christian writing, which failed, <laughs> failed finally to be included in the New Testament canon. See, uh, the canon developed, and this was so early, it's, it's contemporary with the writings of the New Testament that some thought it should be. And in fact, it was read publicly in the worship service in some congregations. And so it was included in some collections of God's word, of canon. And then finally, when the churches all solidified what the canon was, it, it missed the mark just by a little bit. And it's simply um, due to the author and Clement not being one of the apostles. In fact, Clement is, is called, who is it that calls him? Uh, uh, Rufinus? Rufinus? I don't know how you say that name. But uh, this guy says that Clement of Rome uh, was almost an apostle. Jerome says he was an apostolic type man. And uh, another Clement, Clement of Alexandria, he actually calls him an apostle. So he's really close there, you know, overlapping with John. John lived forever. <laughs> not, not literally, not literally. Uh, there's some people who think that, uh, but <laughs> he lived a long time, um, into ripe old age. And, uh, yeah, so Clement was right there at the writing of the New Testament and he wrote this letter. He penned it anyways. It's actually addressed to the church of Corinth from the church of Rome. So this letter is not meant to be read as a, as coming from, you know, a pastor or an apostle a person, it's meant to be coming from a church, which is really fascinating. The opening uh, verses of this letter, and it's it's kind of laid out the same way that Scripture is. You have chapters and verses so you can find your way around this ancient text. It says, the church of God, which is at Rome, or sojourning at Rome, in Rome, to the church of God, which is sojourning in Corinth. And I love that language of sojourning, just sort of as a side note, because what it's showing us there is that we are journeying, that our location isn't the, the final destination. We're, we're making our way to heaven. We're journeying to heaven, and we are doing that together in these locations. All right, so what do we know about Clement? Clement was a disciple of Peter. Clement eventually, this Clement, became the bishop of Rome. He, as I said, was almost an apostle, very close there. Eusebius calls this letter that he wrote the wonderful epistle of St. Clement. So you have this biblical flavor to it and tells us that it was read publicly in the assemblies of the early church. So we, we get that from Eusebius. And, and it is included in some ancient uh, canonical collections. So there's that. So what's the reason for it, though? And you already kind of know as I'm bringing it up in relation to divisions in the church. In First Clement 2, we see where that division is, is coming from, just what the division is. And let me read that to you right now. All honor and enlargement was given unto you in Corinth, and so was fulfilled that which is written, My beloved did eat and drink, he was enlarged and waxed fat, and he kicked. That's Deuteronomy 32.15. From hence came emulation and envy, and strife, and sedition, persecution, and disorder, war, and captivity. So they who were of no renown 
lifted up themselves against the honorable, those of no re reputation against those who were in respect, the foolish against the wise, the young men against the aged. Therefore righteousness and peace are departed from you, because every one hath forsaken the fear of God, and is grown blind in his faith, nor walketh by the rule of God's commandments, nor liveth as is fitting in Christ. But every one follows his own wicked lusts, having taken up an unjust and wicked envy by which death first entered into the world. Now, doesn't that sound like what's going on today? And doesn't it sound like what happened in the Garden of Eden? This is the root problem, right? Pride, this, this arrogance, doubting of God and his word, not, not fearing God, and then trying to rise up to be something more than you are. And by doing so, throwing away the greatness that you already are in Christ. Now, it's said that who, you know, asking who were these people and what's going on in this church, and, and it's probably a group of spiritualists who opposed the authorities, as you could hear, they were rising up against those in, in renown and respect, arguing for the freedom of the spirit. And where do we get that? Well, we can go to 1 Corinthians 14 37. So flip your Bibles there with me now. 1 Corinthians 14. 37, Paul's writing to Corinth, same audience, and this is scripture, of course. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. So Paul was already dealing with some spiritualists, those who were claiming to be, fall, uh, claiming to be prophets, but uh, if they rejected Paul's teaching, would be false prophets, false spiritualists. Uh, so we're, we're probably dealing with the same contingent of people. The same root problem is con continues to fester in this church in Corinth. In chapter 3, the, uh, the Romans, by way of Clement, give us a history of persecution, and persecution that's directly tied to envy and emulation between brothers. These, these are things that, that cause us to be uh, covetous, right? We, we want to emulate what other people have. We, wanna, we, wanna in, we envy them. And these things cause division within the church. We're supposed to be united, but we, we start to see and covet after other people's uh, reputations and, and offices and stuff, all of this kind of thing. So what we get is uh, Cain and Abel, we get Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, Moses and Pharaoh, then Moses and Arian and Miriam, Moses and Dathan and Abiram, David and Saul. He mentions the persecutions of the apostles and, and earliest martyrs, and then says, not only men, but women have been persecuted, and having suffered very grievous and cruel punishments, have finished the course of their faith with firmness. And though weak in body, yet received a glorious reward. This has alienated the minds even of women from their husbands and changed what was once said by our father Adam. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In a word, envy and strife have overturned whole cities and rooted out great nations from off the earth. That just speaks to me regarding all the women's march and the abortion issues, the equality stuff. It's just the same issue. There's nothing new under the sun. Envy and emulation are sources of rebellion, ignoble uprising. They're the sources of disorder, war, and captivity, he says. It leads to the persecution of the faithful, not only individually but corporately. Entire communities suffer when envy and emulation take hold, and the devil is able to nurture the seed of discontent and disillusionment. And now we get 1 Clement 4, which is really where we want to go. These things, beloved, we write unto you, not only for your instruction, but also for our own remembrance. We write unto you, unto you the church in Rome, for your instruction your, the church in Corinth, but also for our remembrance. The one congregation is building up another. When one instructs the other, both are being instructed because the word is being brought to remembrance for both. 
So you really learn something by teaching it. Why? Well, because at the very least, you're engaged with the Word again. The preparation for that instruction is, has an impact on you, the instructor. And the act of giving the instruction is a teaching moment, both for your hearers, but also for you, the instructor. Now, this is important to me and, and to all the saints here at St. Mark, because right now, there is an issue going on where we have a Missouri Synod church that is in fellowship with an ELCA church, and we're trying to lovingly bring them back into fellowship with the Missouri Synod. We don't want to see them go astray. We don't want to see them lost to the ways of the world, to the envy and emulation of the world. We want to see them stay and be our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it's not just you know, a Pastor Bramwell thing as the pastor here. It's the entire congregation has an opportunity to instruct another congregation. One instructing the other, but both remembering what God's Word says. That's huge. Every church in the Synod, every church on the planet should have this spirit, this humble spirit of, of togetherness. That's what Synod means, right? To walk together. We're walking together. Well, that's not just individual members, but church to church. The church in Rome and the church in Corinth, the church in Ferndale and the church in Arcata, where, the church wherever you are. You're walking as a sister church with another, and you want what's good for them. So not division, not, well, this is how we do it, this is how we do it. No, no, no. We're remembering all of us, what we've been instructed by, by Jesus and, and his apostles, what God's word says to all of us. And so we continue. For we are all in the same lists, and the same combat is prepared for us all. This is probably going to take up most of the remaining remainder of the show because combat, division, right? You think about division, this is a, a form of combat. And Clement just says here, as he's writing for the church in Rome to the church in Corinth, for we are all in the same lists and the same combat is prepared for us all. Combat. Let's, let's go for a second to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. You're already in 1 Corinthians, if you've been flipping with me. Let's just go one more book to the right, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. What does Paul say? For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when out your obedience is complete. Combat. Today we have um, a problem in our affluent society. Church militant language makes many Christians uneasy. We have an effeminate church body, too. There's not a lot of men in our pews, mostly women. We, we're, we're uneasy talking about sacrifice and bloodshed and, and the, the things of war. We've done a good job in our, in our day and age of forgetting that every single Christian, men, women, young, old, the brand new baby baptized and and the old man living right next door to his church who lived through World War II, that we're all engaged in spiritual warfare. It's uncomfortable to think about waging war, so we, emph we emphasize the language of peace. We even go so far as Christians to condemn Christians who are fighting the good fight of faith, another phrase from Paul, labeling them as divisive when they take up the sword of the Spirit and engage the false teachers threatening their neighbors. Now let's do that for a second here uh, to make sure you understand the context of that phrase, the sword of the Spirit. Go with me to the most well-known church militant uh, verse in all of the Bible. Go with me to Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, Paul says, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. The armor of God, warfare, warfare. It is not in poor taste to think about the church as an army fighting. Onward Christian soldiers. This is the book club the name of the book club here at St. Mark's, named after the hymn. And every time we gather to discuss the next month's book, we open with the first stanza of that hymn, singing Onward Christian Soldiers. We are soldiers. And guess what? That book club has many women who come. They're not queasy about seeing themselves at war. They recognize that they are at battle against the evil one and his minions of darkness. They're, they're not caught up like many of us today are in thinking we should be only talking about you know, peace and love and gentleness and grace and mercy. These are all biblical words, and we should be using these words, understanding that that's what we receive as the church. Those at peace then engage in war against the powers and principalities that have taken captive our neighbors. Let's take a break right there. We'll be back for more of this conversation. Don't go away. We're just getting into the good stuff. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Put this wisdom of God into practice by listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple, and faithful pastors from around the world help sharpen my faith in Christ every episode. I know you'll be blessed by listening and studying God's Word with us. Listen to Sharper Iron weekdays at 8 a.m. on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Some well-meaning Christians actively denounce their own brothers in arms, those who are in the same lists of combatants with them, fighting so shoulder to shoulder, or should be. And they will actually denounce them because the wolves, the, the opponent, the adversary, is good at using words like love, unity, peace, togetherness, equality, equity, inclusiveness, inclusion, right? All this kind of stuff. Bold Christians, strong pastors. They're usually the ones who end up outcasted, and in the case of pastors removed from office and put on a blacklist. When asked about those pastors, they're described as being too rigid, unloving, needing to learn how to meet their people where they're at, etc., etc., etc. In other words, they're men who are just like Peter and John in Acts 4, 1 to 3. What does that say? Let's go there. Acts 4. Turn there with me. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. These guys were bold. They were preaching the truth. They were telling the rulers of their day and the people of their day they had crucified Jesus. 
like preached the law and then told them to repent and believe in the resurrection of Christ, they would receive the gospel. These are strong men, and they're preaching truth. They're preaching love. They're preaching unity. They're preaching peace. They're preaching togetherness. They're preaching equality in Christ. They're preaching all the things that, there's, that men today are said we're not when we're confident and certain and strong in the faith. How about Jeremiah 1, 9 to 10? Take a look at that with me. That's a great one. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 10. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build up and to plant. See, too often, too often we think that to be bold in the word, to be combative, rightly so as church militant, means you are necessarily unloving. That's the devil's lie. That's exactly what he wants us to think. And that's what all the progressive Christians out there make us feel like when they're saying those words to us. We're going to continue on with this, and we're going to find out how that is false. So let's do this. Uh, This is going to be super helpful for all of you cross defenders. Turn with me to Revelation 2, 1 to 7. We're going to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. This is the first letter to uh, the seven churches, the letter to, to Ephesus. Um, not Corinth, as you know, Clement's letter is, but to Ephesus. And let's, let's see here that love and calling out error, calling out falsehood, preaching truth for the protection of the sheep, for the protection of the flock, those things, are they go together. They go together. They're not at odds with one another. They're, they're not juxtaposed. They're not contrasts, but they're, they're complements. Okay, he says this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers... I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Look how Jesus commends the pastor of Ephesus. If you're familiar with Linsky's uh, Revelation commentary, Linsky comments on love. He says, he gives a great, great definition of love that helps us clearly understand what's going on here. Because love is one of those ambiguous, vague words that's always used uh, in many and various ways. Right? The Greek has many different words that we translate as, to, as love. This is the word agape. Um, and, but even that, is, it's, it's kind of ambiguous. It's hard to nail down. See, love is not, as the world today tells us, the affirmation of sin. I am not loving my homosexual neighbor by being happy that he's in a monogamous homosexual relationship. I'm not loving my transgender teenage neighbor by by su- supporting him or her for having their body mutilated in a gender reassignment surgery, or even telling the teenage parents that I think it's okay. Hey, I'm proud of you. You know, you're helping out your kid. No, that's not loving. Affirming sin is not loving. These are just some of the hot button issues. We don't shy away from the hot buttons here on Cross Defense. We shouldn't do that as a church at all. We don't say things like, I just want her to be happy. It's not acceptance of evil to love. Agreeing to disagree for the sake of peace and unity, that's false peace. That's false unity. Or anything like that for the sake of the perception of peace. We're not doing that. So Linsky is super helpful. He says, love is comprehension 
and corresponding purpose. What the Ephesian pastor was guilty of, what he was beginning to lose sight of, was why he was working in the first place. Why he was toiling and patiently enduring. He was beginning to lose sight of why he couldn't bear those who are evil. Why he was testing those who called themselves apostles but were not. Why he found them to be false. He was beginning to get clouded in what the fight was. What his work was. He hadn't grown weary of calling out false prophets. That's an interesting note. The progressive pastors of his day were still under fire by this faithful pastor who was testing their words against Scripture, testing the false apostles. He was still wholeheartedly denouncing them, but he was beginning to forget why. As Lenski notes, when decline of love sets in, in place of robust, healthy development, we should be alarmed. For the next step is still greater darkening of knowledge of the word. Inroads of error, loud claims of love while no longer knowing what genuine love for Christ and true believers is. That's the description of the woke Christian churches today. They have fully fallen from the first love of Jesus' cross. This first love that Jesus is talking to the Ephesian pastor about. See, the Ephesian pastor hadn't gone that far yet. He was beginning to lose that love. Only the first decline had occurred, Lenski notes. The decline had not proceeded to the extent of accepting those who called themselves apostles while they were nothing of the kind, among them the, the Nicolaitans. This is a reflective question for all of us, pastor and layman alike. Have we accepted the false prophets of our day? Is our loss of love so far gone? Have we lost love so much that we accept the false teachers who claim to be of the apostolic faith, but are nothing of the sort? Love is true comprehension and understanding coupled with corresponding purpose what Linsky says. Great definition. Love is comprehension and understanding coupled with corresponding purpose. Is your comprehension of Scripture still that it is the inspired, inerrant Word of God for the salvation of all, that none should perish? And is that comprehension coupled with your life purpose of saving the lost? within your vocation? Are your actions as a Christian honestly about saving souls? Or has it devolved into something else? Leftist Christianity has forgotten the first love of Christ. We know this by what they say and do, by what they preach, by testing their words against Scripture. They mingle the gospel with false religions for the sake of happy feelings of inclusion, false peace, false unity. They're loudly claiming love while no longer knowing what genuine love for Christ and for true believers is. There's no comprehension and understanding coupled with corresponding purpose. It's missing. It's gone. So if you're going down that road, my friend, if you find yourself making arguments for the acceptance of sin and erroneous doctrines, if you find yourself no longer seeing how sexual sins are wrong, if you find yourself agreeing that love is love, etc., if you find yourself th buying into the systemic racism stuff that's being pushed our way or, or the equality, diversity, and inclusion, all of that covers every one of the examples I could come up with, then you're starting to decline into error. Love is true comprehension and understanding coupled with corresponding purpose. The first love that we're to hold on to is Christ's love. The cross. Christ crucified for the forgiveness of our sins and for the forgiveness of the world's sins. That first love is to remember why we're in combat. It's combative love. What does Jude say? Ah, when's the last time you read Jude? Let's go there now. 
we're already in Revelation, so just flip, you know, one or two pages to the left. Now you're in Jude. We're going to read pretty much most of this. Let's see if we can get it done. Jude says, we're going to start at verse 3. We'll skip his little greeting. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend. This is a fighting word, to campaign toward a goal for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the Nicolaitans were doing. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. It's exactly what was going on in, in Corinth that Rome is writing this letter that Clement penned, right? Envy and emulation, trying to rise up, take over the vocations of others and all the, the things that they, they're coveting after. But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil, again, contending, fighting, struggling, campaigning with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. It's not about you know, Pastor Bramwell rebuking someone or Michael rebuking. It's the Lord's rebuke. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. You might want to say all they do not love, comprehend. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning, again, comprehension language, unreasoning animals understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, your comprehension coupled with purpose feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. We could Continue, but let's jump down to, uh, uh, just for the sake of time, 19, 20, 21. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Keep yourselves in the comprehension and coupled purpose of fighting against these people, hating what the Lord hates, and doing the work patiently. Okay, we have much more to talk about, and we're just about out of time. So this is going to be a part one. You're going to have to come back next episode, next week, for part two of Clement, where we talk about uh, more of this combat language, and we'll finish looking at the, entire, the entirety of chapter four. And, and the, the root causes here in this church of division and how Rome is helping to sort that out. Thank you all for listening today. Thanks for coming along with me. This is Cross Defense. Uh, we have a few other emails we've been getting in, some topics that are coming our way that we're going to be getting to. So if you uh, have suggested something for the show, uh, thank you for that. We will be getting to your suggestions sooner or later, hopefully not too much later, but sooner or later, we will be getting to them. We got one on Halloween that we're going to try to get to before Halloween, so that'll be great. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for being part of the Cross Defense family, for being part of the KFUO family here, and for your support. If you like this show, if it is equipping your mind, exciting your imagination, and comforting your soul, may I ask you to please give us a good review on your favorite podcast app, if that's how you're listening, and most uh, Cross Defense listeners are and doing it via podcast, and uh, share it with a friend, share it with a family member, share it with a, someone who uh, may appreciate this topic of this episode or, or any of the episodes, just share it with them. That really helps us, and it helps me as the host to know 
you know, which topics are really uh, on your minds and that you need guidance on and more information about what you're curious about and want to want to further um, prepare yourself for as you're engaging with this wacky world we're in with God's law and God's gospel. So, okay, thanks for listening. It's been a fun hour with you. Come back next next time, next week, and we will continue in First Clement uh, chapter 4. God be praised. Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.